What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. Look, I'm so appreciative of the content that we create day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year for the past five plus years. Yo, it's been a journey. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been rocking with us. If you didn't know, I'm going to tell you right now, we exist to center and amplify black and brown folks at work. And we do that by having really frank, authentic conversations. Think about like the conversations you have with a friend or a colleague or a mentor or aspiring mentor or mentee over drinks or coffee or whatever. It's when you're really having those real conversations about career and life and navigating the workplace. I was not privileged to have a ton of those conversations, but but the five that I did <laughs> really bless me. Now I'm playing. I have more than five. I mean, come on. I've been working for a while, so I've had more than five. It feels like I've had like I feel like I can count the really authentic conversations on one hand. And I just remember years ago thinking about what does it look like to bottle that up and make it accessible to thousands of people because everyone doesn't isn't privileged to have someone that looks like you pull you aside over coffee or just on the side and give you the real talk and that's what living corporate is all about yes you're listening to the flagship show but living corporate is a network of shows and everything that we do is based around authentically centering and amplifying historically marginalized voices at work by investigating interrogating the systems and imagining a better more equitable place to work Yes, we fall into the diversity, equity, inclusion space, but we don't really use that language like that because a lot of that has been co-opted, watered down and centered around people that don't really need it. We're trying to have authentic conversations every single day that center and amplify the people that actually need to be centered and amplified, which are black and brown people, black and brown women, black and brown queer folks, black and brown trans folks, black and brown non-binary folks, black and brown disabled folks, black and brown first generation people, right? Black and brown folks, period, right? That's what we're trying to do. And so thank you so much. I'm excited about the conversation you're about to listen to. We'll be right back. Trisha, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Nice to see you, Zach. Hey, it's nice to see you. It's nice to meet you. I'm really excited about our conversation today. Now, look, um, I'm really, I get really passionate about, I mean, honestly, this is why Living Corporate exists, right? Like, it's all about having, like, really frank conversations about the lived experiences of historically marginalized perspectives and people um, and really, like, the intersection of those lived experiences, like, within the, the world of work. Now, look, you have um, you're a lot of different things, like to a lot of different in a lot of different spaces. Right. So between like being like a mentor and a coach and an executive and an author and a speaker, like, yeah, uh, like, you're 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 all over the place. Like in, 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 in terms of in terms of like just your your brand and your your level of efficacy. I'm curious, like, what did it look like for you to like understand how to show up like as as a leader in all these different spaces and places, like what was that journey like for you? That's a great question. And, you know, when I started my career, I certainly did not uh, imagine that I would be in all these different places. And um, I think, you know, my family probably questions all of my decisions. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I started my, so I'm a first generation Athena. Uh, my mom is from El Salvador, my dad's from Ecuador, grew up in LA, uh, and you know, education was a priority for them. And um, when I started, you know, went to college, law school, and I started my career in big corporate law. And I really had no uh, playbook for how I could do that. Um, you know, I didn't have a family network, uh, you know, colleague, anybody to really explain it. So. Um, and my parents, in, you know, they suffered from discrimination um, as immigrants and they had Spanish accents. So they had advised me to assimilate, you know, blend in. I didn't have an accent. Uh, it'll be easier for you. Um, so that was the advice that I got. And that is how I started uh, my career and frankly uh, downplayed my ethnicity for about 20 years um, and really just climbed the corporate ladder to me. 
you know, dealing with gender bias in a pretty male dominated space of corporate and, and I was in um, enterprise software. Uh, it's, it's a male dominated, dominated space. So uh, gender bias was enough. <laughs> Um, but what resulted in that was not, you know, adapting, like you said, like, you know, I'm in all these spaces. And so I had to adapt to figure out how to survive in those spaces. I had to put up a lot of armor to protect myself from, um, the realities of being in that, those spaces. Um, and in some ways, in a lot of ways, uh, it, you know, over two decades, it was, traumatic in some ways and causes trauma, but in some ways I have a skill of adaptability. Um, and so now when you ask the question, how do I show up in all these spaces? Um, I really have perfected the ability to scan a room, evaluate who's there, what's going on. Um, do I have, you know, allies in the room? Do I not? Am I going to show up? Um, you know, how am I going to show up that is both safe to me in that moment? Um, and continue the work that I'm doing on advocating for um, equity in the workplace. And so, um, you know, and and I've tried to now in this stage of my life and career, um, I've had the great fortune of being able to be in leadership positions, grow a network, and have the privilege to be in spaces um, where I can uh, continue to, have a voice to try to make things different um and i have an ear for you know some of those because i have relationships you know so you talk I about try to you know that like and try to make coming into a space um and you being you like your parents coming from uh, from south america um and 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 really coming in and being told to like assimilate and you said you did that for like two decades like so talk to me about like what is that what does that practically look like to to hide or shrink yeah. parts of yourself and like like practically speaking when you say you assimilated um like what does that look like practically yeah yeah so practically speaking it looks like um straightening my hair you know i have naturally curly hair so i would straighten it because to me what I saw in media and, and in the workplace was, you know, straight hair means professional. Uh, the way I dressed, I, you know, I looked around and, and said, okay, well, you know, black and blue, navy blue suit is how you're a lawyer, That's what a lawyer looks like. Um, it looks like my language, how, what language I use. I have a loud laugh. I mean, we're, we're a loud family coming from Ecuador. And, um, and so, you know, dampening that laugh and dampening um, the way my, um, the way I, you know, my mannerisms and the way I show up. Um, I, I didn't talk about my family. I didn't talk about um, the celebrations that we might have celebrated that were different or the food that we ate um, that was different than what those around me were eating. Uh, I didn't, I hid the fact that I didn't know, um, you know, I came from working class, so I was unfamiliar with different cuisines. Um, I hadn't eaten sushi and lobster and knew the different wines. And so I had to like figure out um, how to just pretend that um, I knew some of these things. And so it was constantly just trying to learn what the dominant environment around me accepted as, um, as you know, at what what everybody around me looked and ate and seemed like, and, and tried to adapt myself to fit that because I didn't I didn't see anyone like me. There were no women in leadership. There were no women of color, no Latinas um, from much of my career. So like, I didn't I think know how me, I, I get. Like it, it, it's just sad to hear, right? Because I think about also like I wonder if there were ever moments in your career where like maybe things were said or done around you that you felt were like really offensive or and that like and that you had to just like swallow in the spirit of let me just oh yeah like focus on the career like, like do you ha are there do you like without yeah. like if it isn't too triggered or re-traumatizing do you have any examples of that oh yeah I mean it happened all the time um, because I could if you will you know pass um people I would there would be derogatory comments around 
um, and still are um, around immigration, around Latinos, um, you know, affirmative action, diversity mandates uh, in the workplace. Um, even now, you know, my my girls are going through college application process and. Um, you know, being in spaces where, you know, because I live in a probably white community, uh, you know, the injustice of affirmative action programs. And, you know, I, you know, I'm constantly in those spaces where um, people aren't realizing that they're talking about me, uh, you know, and the, my life and my lived experience. And, and it wasn't a safe space, nor did I have the strength or tools back then to, um, stand up to it or to call it out. Uh, I, I wanted, I allowed myself to be uncomfortable uh, in, in the priority to make sure everyone around me was comfortable. Uh, because I knew that if I said, wait a minute, I'm gonna question that or combat, you know, talk, I have a different opinion, it would make people uncomfortable. And so, um, you know, it just, it was it was strategies that I I think many of us use to you know protect ourselves and to and to do it. Um, but what a disservice! I mean, I think what I learned and kind of and maybe we'll go into like how did I change, but um, what a disservice that was to not only myself, my own emotion, emotional well being, um, but for those in the workplace. You know, I so desperately wanted to see what a Latina. Uh, leader looks like, a successful one. I so desperately wanted to see what a successful working mother in leadership looked like, and I didn't see it. And by me downplaying or hiding that part of my life, what a disservice that is to the women and women of color coming up to the organization. Um, I was not, I'm not well, sure. First of all, I mean, as, I, and, um, and I, I, and I say this because like, I think see. about, so like my, <laughs> One of my visible, my, my, some of my diversity is very visible, right? Um, that doesn't change the fact that, you know, that darker skin, black folks and other, and, and darker skin, Latina mm-hmm. folk, uh, Latinx, Latin folks, as well as other people, like, you know, they don't try to still hide who they are or, or, or rather, or rather, uh, shrink parts of themselves. Um, uh, but, but man, I just, I really applaud the fact that you're able to, that you look back and you say, man, okay. Like I'm like, you, you didn't stay there. Right. Like in the fact that that's part of your journey, like that's very inspiring to me. Um, everybody, I don't know, Trisha, like, honestly, I meet a lot of people who, um, you know, they forget who they are, you know, like for like, like that's not like, just to say it straight up is they just forget who they are. Um, mm-hmm. and then, and then mm-hmm. to the point where when they then see someone else to your point, you're looking for someone who like, what does it look like to, to be like a Latina in, in like in leadership, like in, in, in this industry, when they finally see someone who is living like that, their own insecurities, it, it then turns them resentful or frustrated because, or ashamed because of their own shortcomings. So I think that's super dope. I mean, I definitely want us to get into yeah. and talk about like the work that you've, um, the work that you've been doing as well as your own award-winning business memoir, embracing the power of you owning your identity at work. Like, I would just love to understand, like, at what point did you, did that switch and say, you know what? No, I am, I am not just a woman. I happen to also be like, like I'm, like I'm a, I'm a child of, of immigrants. I'm a first generation American. Like, like what happened? Like, what was there? A, was, was there a particular moment for you to say, you know what? No, this is who I am. Yes and no. There was a particular moment that I'll, I'll share, but it also was a journey. Uh, you know, I would say that um, I had, re- I would say about 10 or 12 years into my career, I just kept hitting uh, so many walls and I kept having to overcome over and over again. I didn't know, you know, I know now based on you know, research and, and education um, that there were biases and microaggressions and all the things, uh, but I didn't know what was happening. I just, you know, I was resilient and I just kept going, but over time that takes a toll. And so I had reached a point where I was just really emotionally and physically exhausted, you know, it was just exhausting. And so I had taken some time away from kind of corporate and started my own consulting business and uh, really just get out of that, you know, day-to-day um, environment. 
but then I also, you know, it's a dirt, that was a time of self-reflection and a time of really unpacking a lot of these things. And so that's where I say that, it, I would say that's when kind of the journey started of just really reflecting, like, why am I feeling like this? What is happening? I mean, that took years. That took a long time to really reflect. Um, when I got past, uh, not past, but when I unpacked a lot of things over years, uh, I found myself in a fantastic opportunity at a company called Looker, who had a great environment. Uh, and at that point, uh, we, well, let me backtrack a little bit. One of the things that in my life that was incredibly hard was when I first had my uh, daughter. I was in an all-male leadership team. And when I and I knew that and there were no women in leadership and I knew that it would it would not be well received that I was going to go out on maternity leave because I they really relied on me and all the things. So um, when I announced my pregnancy, the my man my then manager said to me, "How could you do this to me? I've seen this movie." Hold on, everybody, stop. Is. Wait a I second. Literally nope. didn't talk to me for weeks. Nope. <laughs> and that was the response I got. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So I have two daughters. Um, my wife is uh, fortunate enough to make me a father. Um, you're saying you you're saying that you mm-hmm. were pregnant and your boss said, how could you do this to me? What did you say when he said that to you? I was frozen. Uh, you know, I just froze. I didn't, you know... It, I was the sole breadwinner of my family. Uh, I I didn't know. I didn't say anything. I mean, like I said, he walked away. And so I had to sit with that. And I knew that he was unhappy. I knew that um, I needed this job. I was about to go on maternity leave. I couldn't leave. You know, I needed to have benefits. I didn't have much of a choice. And so you know, I tried to make the transition as easy as possible. But... Um, as a result, and this is, I talk about this in my book, I didn't just Mm. downplay being um, a Latina, I downplayed being a mother, a working mother. Uh, And when I returned my, from maternity leave, my daughter uh, wouldn't take the bottle. She would only nurse. It's by weeks of trying to train her. Um, She wouldn't take the, the bottle. And so we didn't have nursing rooms. And we didn't have any women. I didn't know what to do. And so I would nurse her in the parking garage secretly until we could get her onto the bottle. Because I feared, you know, the, the reaction that I got for um, being pregnant and going on maternity leave was so bad that, um, I, you know, what, to me to go back into that space and say, I need to leave every three hours. This was, you know, we didn't have much time or remote or anything. Um, felt very risky. So... Um, so that, as you can imagine, was traumatic. That whole entire experience as being a working parent, as a working mother, was incredibly hard. Um, and so fast forward to that moment at Looker, there was a woman going out on maternity leave, and I decided she needs to have a different experience than me. It's just she needs to feel supported. We need to have resources. We need to... I mean, it just has to be different. We need to change things. And we had a great culture. And that's where we started um, the DEI program. We didn't have one. And we started the DEI program um, because of that. But, you know, a year later, we had about 12 employee resource groups, uh, one of which was a Latinx uh, group. And they asked me to tell my story during Hispanic Heritage Month. And that was the first time anyone had really asked me to tell my story publicly in my workplace. And so that, you know, that moment of, wow, what does that mean telling my story? Are people going to look at me differently? Am I going to be judged? Am I, I had a a ton of fear around it, uh, you know, because of all the things, you know, based you know, all the things I'd heard in the workplace prior, you know, prior to this, um, not at that place. Uh, but I did it anyways. And the impact that that story had on my, the employees and particularly the Latino employees and Latinas, um, I had several Latinas come up to me and just say like, they were in tears, just 
Your story is my story. I've never seen a Latina in leadership. Thank you. That's when I decided I must change the way I'm showing up because it matters to others and it makes a difference. And I think that's when it clicked that by me not being visible for that next generation, um, I'm just going to continue complicit in this whole system. And I'm curious, so, like, I mean, and you have, you have the, the, the privilege of, of hindsight and you also have the privilege of like of having such a like a long and illustrious career do you feel like if you had shown up more authentically to who um you are or who you were at the time that you would have had the same similar or more success that you did experience yeah that's a good question um I certainly don't think more. Uh, you know, when I started my career was, you know, 25 years ago, things were different. At least we had a lot of work still to do, but we've made progress. We were not having these kinds of conversations back then. Um, and there were not allies. Uh, we didn't have words around it. So um, I don't think I had the tools to withstand because there would have been backlash. And I don't know that I would have had the strength or the tools to figure out or the, frankly, the support, you know, we didn't have affinity groups, we didn't have organizations, or, I mean, maybe, but not to the extent that we have them now. Um, so I didn't, I wouldn't have known where to go to be in a safe space to say, oh my God, can you imagine, this is what happened to me, this is what they said to me, how do I, you know, am I crazy, am I hearing that right, you know, like, I didn't have anybody to bounce things off of, so um, I don't know that I could have had the just tools to get through that. Um, I don't know that anybody, I think this is unconscious bias, right? I don't know that anybody necessarily would have treated me badly. I mean, maybe some, but I don't think so. You know, I think it's all unconscious. I think it's people are not recognizing the impact of their words. Um, and, and had I had the strength and um, better grounding in who I was, then, um, you know, I could have done it, but I just don't think I personally had had that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's incredible and a beautiful thing that like you're here in this space now showing up now. Um, so let's talk more about your book, right? Like you're in this, you're, you've, you have the, the beauty of like, I'm not gonna say like, you're like a sage, right. But like you, but you have like this incredible story in this background of, of, of hiding parts of yourself. So I think like you are in this unique position of what it really means to like really encourage and give wisdom as to like really being your full, um, owning your full identity. So like when we talk about like the real you, um, and like we say, okay, you know, you, you be yourself and you know, people always say, you want to be yourself. What does that really mean? Like, what does it mean to really be yourself at work, especially when you talk about embracing and celebrating every aspect of who you are? You know, I think it's a really uh, difficult thing to say for everybody. It, de it depends, you know, I think, um, I think there is a, a level of agency around it that matters. I think that, there may be things that you're that the space around you hasn't earned the right to hear, mm. um, and that's a choice that you need to to make. Um, but I do think that if if you are not comfortable bringing your whole self, with meaning your lived experience, whether it's race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, economic, all the things that make up who you are, then you put up armor. And that armor, what it does is it creates a barrier between you and others, um, whether that's your colleagues, your managers. And so you never really create that human connection. And that human connection is what makes you excited to go to work. It's what makes you engaged. It's what, it, it, it allows you to talk about real things that are happening you know, you know, for example, you know, I'm in the stage now where I have elderly parents and, you know, there are moments where I have to go and, 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 and take care of them. And so um, if you have to hide any part of your life, whether it's the birth of a child, an elderly parent, 
the grief of a loved one, a miscarriage. There's so many things that happen to us uh, as people, as humans. Um, and if you have this facade that you've put up um, because you're in the culture, or because you're afraid it will be rejected, um, you're just you're just not going to make that connection that makes you excited about showing up. And so I, you know, it's a process um, to feel comfortable doing it. And I think everyone's on their own journey. But I do believe that getting on the other side of that journey, um, that's when you really find your magic. That's when you really can um, soar. Because at the end of the day, people love real people. They love and get connected to people that um, share their vulnerabilities and, and talk about the challenges because we all have them. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, I think, I think, and this is where I, I think a lot of these like conversations, um, they, they go, they go wrong and not in, not in like what you're saying, Hey, ch charging the, like the individual, typically the historically marginalized, um, and, or just like non-majority person at work to be themselves and, or to like really understand and do the inner work of who love just like, Hey, like how do I celebrate me and, and what am I, what do I really want? What do I really want? Like on my billboard as I'm walking down the street, metaphorically, um, mm -hmm. I think where we mess up is we like really index on the individual, but we don't talk about the systems and structures to facilitate yeah. even like giving mm -hmm. people the grace and safety to do that. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, like, as as someone who sat like in the senior most executive seats, like like you know you were like a senior 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 executive, you were a junior executive, you were a mid level manager, you were a frontline leader, and you were also an individual contributor. Like, what do you believe is like is critical for leaders, like those who actually control the organization, right? Not someone with just the title, but the people who actually call the shots, like those executive level leaders. What do you think is critical for them to understand? So that the Trisha Montavo Tims at their organizations don't feel the need to to shrink themselves, any element of themselves um, at work. Like, what do you think that they need to be mindful of? And frankly, what do they need to be doing? Yeah, they need to be doing the work. And I think, you know, a lot of us in this space, um, those um, historically marginalized are the ones doing the work and not uh, not the other way around. And, you know, I think you're exactly right back that the space needs to um, also do the work. And, um, you know, at, at the top line leadership, it needs to be intentional. Um, one of the things that um, that my CEO at my last company, Looker, he had an aha moment where he realized that he believes in DEI, you know, believes in it, thinks it's the right thing to do, but wasn't intentional about, um, about how we were going to get there. And when he had that moment and realized that we had to keep the executive team accountable and we had to have metrics and we had to have cultural surveys and we had to have feedback that's intentionally trying to um, create a space of belonging versus believing that it's a good thing to have um, so I think intention is an important piece of it um, and you know and I think it has to also go down the line you know I think manager training is so important because the end of the day a person when they're at work even if you know we have all the right corporate diversity statements and policies and whatnot your experience is with that of your manager um, and so if your manager is not creating psychological safety with you um, it doesn't matter what the policies say right because you are not going to feel safe um, and I think how you can gain psychological safety at work um, as, as managers and leaders we have to um, be curious about others, um, learn about differences, be in spaces with other people that are different from you. You know, take a look around your social circles, and um, you know, how how is this? Does it all look the same, or is there any difference there? Um, you know, recognize where your own biases might be. We all have biases, so what are they? Um, do that work. Um, and then be vulnerable about it. You know, we, we are also all going to make mistakes. Um, and so getting comfortable, being uncomfortable, getting comfortable 
um, saying you're sorry and how can I be better when you make that mistake and not being afraid to try because many people are nervous about this conversation, especially in liter leadership, they want to get it wrong. Um, and I think that, um, you know, having the courage to, um, to take that risk and, 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 and do some of the work. And then, you know, like if you could talk to, you know, you, you early in this conversation, you talked about well, two things. First off, you talked about the fact that, um, you know, your, your skin tone enabled you to pass in certain ways and spaces that, um, that maybe other, that other, uh, uh, Latino, uh, Latinx folks could not. Right. So I'm curious, what do you think? Um, actually I'm glad this isn't live. Cause I don't, I don't want to ask that question. I'm gonna ask this question instead. Um, so Aaron, Aaron, Aaron clean that up. Um, so when we talk about, when we talk about like this intersection of like just different identities, right? So it's not, it's race, it's gender, it's sexual orientations, disability, visible and invisible disability, um, for being a, being a first generation, um, uh, citizen, um, or not, um, things of that nature, you know, like colorism comes into play as well. I'm curious, like, and we're having this conversation, um, in the middle of we're publishing this conversation in the middle of Hispanic heritage month, like, what would you say are like the key drivers to, uh, combat colorism within the uh, the Latinx community? It's a great question. You know, I think uh, even within our own community, uh, we have a lot of bias. Uh, we are, uh, the, the, I say Latino, and this is the other thing. There's so many different and, and Educate and, me, educate uh, me right <laughs> now. Educate me. Yeah, I know. You know, uh, what, what I say to people is, simply ask what people's preferences are because it really, there is no standard. Um, you know, I think my generation, we use Latino, I use Latina. I recognize Latino is male pronoun and, you know, it doesn't cover, you know, all genders. Um, it's just, it's just something that I got used to. So it doesn't bother Respect. me, uh, but it bothers a lot of people. Yeah. Right. So Latin, uh, Latinx is a younger generation. Um, many people don't like Hispanic because it has some other connotations. So, um, you know, I, I don't, you just, thank ask, you. You know, what, what's your preference? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But within our community, the Latino community, um, we are very diverse. Um, some of us speak Spanish. Some of us don't. Um, some of these, some of us speak Portuguese. Uh, we are from different countries. Um, we are. Um, we have Afro Latinas. We have um, first generation, second generation immigrants. We, I mean, we have. It is just across the board, very diverse. And as a result, I think, um, and we have, you know, racism within our own community, depending on any slice that you take that, uh, you know. And so, I think that we have our own work to do in our community of how do we come together. I mean, the Latino community is the fastest growing demographic in this mm -hmm. country. We are one in five in the U.S. We are 40% of the population in California. And we are huge demographic, but we don't come together as well as we could as a demographic because of things like colorism and um, other things. And so I think we have to be honest about that as a community um, and know that if we come together, um, we have a lot more ability to influence and, 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 and change structures. But um, while we're the biggest demographic, we're the least represented or one of the least represented um, in positions of leadership. 100%. I mean, I think, I think that is like, I mean, first of all, we just had a real moment right here in this, right in this conversation, which I'm, I'm so excited about, but it's like, there's this draw, this temptation to, like to just bundle everybody in one group, right? Like the, mm -hmm. the Latino Latina community is super huge, right? It, it kind of reminds me of like the Asian community, right? Like sometimes you say Asian, yeah. you think it's like, oh, it's like, yo, there's like, like tens of thousands of cultures and, and groups and experiences represented yeah. in these groups. Like when you just say, like to your point, yeah. use the term Hispanic or Asian or whatever, it's like, 
yo, you're erasing and like, and like really insulting, like a large group of people, irrespective of your, of your intention. Okay. So anyway, I just, I just mm-hmm. wanted to ask that question. So my, my next question I was really excited about, cause you said something, I was like, okay, I'm gonna put a pin in that. So you said, you said everyone doesn't deserve, like you have to make a de- decision that people deserve, like what it is you want to share. That's like a, I think that's like a very self-aware and emotionally intelligent place to be. Like, how does one make mm-hmm. a determination as to like what other people are worthy of knowing about them? Like, I don't, and I think that that's some, I don't know if that's something that like, I, I'm going to say across the board, like just black and brown folks across the board. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we always even like are operating in that mode. So can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest difference now um, was I was operating unconsciously before. I didn't really recognize, I had normalized so much my downplaying and um, assimilating that I didn't even recognize what I was doing with Mm. that. Um, And so if there was a comment, derogatory comment or otherwise that was happening, you know, I sort of just pack it away and, you know, move it forward and, and, and don't you know, and choose not to respond to it. Um, and now I'm aware of it. I'm aware of who I'm more aware. I think we're always on a journey, so there's always learning. But I am more aware of um, who I am, where I come from, um, the pain those types of comments make, um, the risk that there might be in showing up, you know, vulnerably in a situation. Um, and the difference now is I have agency over that. I now make a decision. Um, is this the time where I'm going to um, question that comment? Um, do I have the toolkit to do it? Do I have allies in the room to support me? Um, and it change, It can change from day to day. I can decide today that, yes, um, I am good. That, you know, that one is really important. I'm not going to let that one slide, and I'm going to confront it. Um, and tomorrow I could be dealing with personal things at home or, you know, kids or parent, aging parents or whatever. And, and I don't have the emotional, um, not the most great emotional state to, you know, take on racism at work. So I may choose not to, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's having agency and making that decision consciously, um, rather than before, I just wasn't combating anything because I didn't really recognize how that was impacting me, how it was impacting others. Um, what was, you know, uh, the larger issue around it. If you could go back and tell Trisha back in, let's say like 1998. Mm, okay. Three things. And frankly, maybe these three things also might apply to like other First gen Latino Latina uh, aspiring world changers and executives and like and authors and and all the things that you are now like what are those three things you would you would tell yourself? The first thing I would tell myself is um, you are enough. Mm. You are enough, uh, and uh, I think that. You know, as I go and talk about this book, the greatest impact I'm having is in that generation, those that are starting their careers, um, and almost gives them permission to be themselves. And I, I wish I knew that I was enough, um, and that what I brought to the table mattered, that my voice mattered, that my opinions mattered, and that I was not there as a mistake, uh, that I earned the, my spot. Um, and that I deserve to be in the room. Uh, so that would be um, the first thing. The second thing I would say is um, you can't go through this journey alone. Uh, you need to find your uh, find your people, whether that's um, a personal champion, whether that's um, a mentor, whether that's uh, an executive coach, a community, uh, you know, going through you know, organizations and corporate and all the things, um, there's a lot to learn and, you know, trying to learn on your own, uh, you don't need to do it. You, you know, there are people out there that are going to support you. And so lean on those mentors and sponsors to help you. Um, 
And then the last thing I think I would say is uh, hard work is not enough. Uh, you know, the, the way you climb the ladder and um, build and scale and is through authentic relationships. Uh, people call it networking, but I, I believe it is building authentic relationships with people that see your value uh, and um, staying in touch and, and investing and nurturing those over time. Um, every opportunity that I got in my career was from somebody that I worked with, and it was up and down, people that I were senior to me and the people that were junior to me. Uh, so everyone matters in, as you go through your career and treating everyone with respect uh, and, um, and finding how you can help them. I think all, all of this, you know, comes back around. So, um, you know, creating that, that um, those relationships matter. Well, look, Trisha, it's been a pleasure and honor to have you on the show. Um, this has been a fire conversation and uh, we count you as a, as a friend of the show. You're more than welcome to come back anytime. And uh, it's always love. We will, uh, we'll talk to you soon. And we're back. Yo, thank you so much for listening to Living Corporate. You know where we at. We're everywhere you listen to podcasts. You know what I'm saying? We're literally everywhere you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about Living Corporate, living dash corporate please say the dash.com or just google living corporate you know what i'm saying at this point seo is pretty popping you type in living corporate we're gonna pop up somewhere okay make sure you check us out links in the show notes so you learn more about us learn what we're trying to do make sure you actually create a profile on living dash corporate.com okay make a profile on there so you can actually stay in tune and up to date with what we got going on you make a profile you select content that you're really interested in and then we'll push content to you from our library so you can actually have a curated experience every time you go and log into living corporate ain't that dope okay think about that we got over a thousand podcasts and and different digital media and content that we've made over the years and it's going to be all pushed and curated for you baby for you dog for you all right till next time i love you take care of yourself Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.